In this video, we're going to take a look at hypothesis testing for two sample means where sigma is unknown, this time for variances that are assumed to be equal. Notice that I did give you a summary sheet for this particular test, and typically I wouldn't in the second video of a, of a section, but the reason that I had to is because this is going to be different. Obviously, variances are considered equal is different than variances considered unequal and the degrees of freedom is n1 plus n2 minus 2, but the test statistic is also different. The test statistic is, has everything to do with the fact that the variances are considered equal and therefore we're going to pool the variances. So it's kind of a complicated little function here, but again, it's not going to stress us too much because as long as we set up Excel correctly the first time, then it will continue to give us the correct examples and we won't have to worry about making mistakes with parentheses and squares and square root functions. So that's why I strongly encourage you to set up Excel correctly. So again, hypothesis testing for means sigma unknown with variances equal. We've got the n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom and the very complicated um, standard error. Let's take a look at this question. A home improvement warehouse claims that customers interested in completing their own home improvement projects can save time by attending its workshops. Specifically, the warehouse claims that amateur do-it-yourself customers who attend its tiling workshops take less time. So we're gonna say those who go to the workshops, oops, do-it-yourself customers who attend the tiling workshops take less time on average than those who do not. So those who do not is going to be group two and we're going to use less than as our alternative hypothesis. So before we continue reading, we have just determined the null hypothesis is that mean one is equal to mean two or mean one minus mean two is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis says that those who go to the workshop will take less time than those who do not, or mean one minus mean two is less than zero. All right, now let's go ahead and find our values. To test the claim, a randomly selected group of 10 customers, so that's N1, who attended the workshops is later surveyed about the time it took to finish their tiling projects. People in this group spent a mean of 14.1 hours, that's X bar one, completing their projects with a standard deviation, S1, of 2.3 hours. Another 10 customers, that's N2, randomly chosen for the study from the warehouse's customer base who did not attend the workshops prior to completing their projects, spent a mean of 15 hours, X bar two, on their projects with a standard deviation of 2.4 hours, S2. Test the claim at the 0 0.01 level of significance, alpha. Assume the variances of the populations are unknown, but assumed to be equal, because the samples both come from the warehouse's customer base and the distributions of times to complete the tiling projects are approximately normal for both populations. Shoo! All right, so we have everything we need. Let's get going. Here's our summary. Again, check conditions. Yes, both samples are randomly selected. Both population standard deviations are unknown. We are given that both population distributions are approximately normal, even though obviously N1 and N2 are small. We are told they're both normal. And we know they have equal variances, again, because we're told. And then we have our null and alternative hypotheses that we've already talked about. To gather our data or collect the necessary sample statistics really is a matter of being able to plug things into Excel correctly. So as you saw a few slides ago, the uh, formula that we need to use to find the test statistic is a doozy, and you can see it again here. There are a lot of ways to mess this up when you're putting this into your calculator or into Excel. So I encourage you to take your time to set it up correctly the first time so that really Excel is going to be doing all of the hard work for you. 
So again, using Excel or a calculator, you should come up with a test statistic of negative 0.856. And then we're also on this step going to find the critical value. And remember the critical value for the rejection region is going to be for that left tail. And so T inverse of 0.01 comma 18. So where's the 18 come from? That's our degrees of freedom, which is N1 plus N2 minus two. In this case, that's 10 plus 10 minus two, which is where we got 18. So again, that's just T inverse, and then the alpha level and the degrees of freedom. And then for our P value, we are going to take T dist, and again, it's a left tailed, so it's just gonna be T dist, negative 0 0.856 comma degrees of freedom which is again 18 and there may or may not be a comma one for cumulative i can't recall for sure but you should end up with our p-value of 0 0.202 so my conclusion with p equals 0 0.202 greater than 0 0.01 which is alpha we fail to reject the null hypothesis remember we're always talking about the alternative so this indicates there is not sufficient evidence at the 0.01 level of significance to say that people who complete the tiling workshops take less time on average to complete their projects compared to those who do not attend the workshops. And to see exactly what the difference is, we will of course want to use our critical value that we found for our rejection region which is 2.552. Now keep in mind that critical value is negative, but this plus or minus means that we're using both the positive and negative. So notice I'm writing it in there as a positive 2.552. Our point estimate is simply X bar one minus X bar two. And then we have our critical value. And then this is that whole mess of stuff that we used before when we were finding the denominator of our test statistic. So as you can see, I'm going to let Excel do all of that work and I end up with a margin of error of 2.7. I subtract that and add that to my point estimate of negative 0.9, which is of course what happens when I subtract those two values. And I end up with negative 3.6 to positive 8.1. Keep in mind that when I'm writing my conclusion, there are two parts. The first part is to say, what exactly does this mean? And so I'm saying that we believe that those who take the tiling workshop will complete their project in 3.6 fewer hours or less time, or 1.8 hours more time than those who don't complete the tiling workshop. The second part is to talk about whether or not it supports our decision. So our hypothesized value of zero obviously is between a negative and positive value, and therefore this supports failing to reject the null hypothesis. Let's take a look now at Excel. And as you can see, I have just made these input columns again, and this is the information that's given to me in the question. So 14.1, 2.310 for N1, I'm sorry, for sample one, and then 15, 2.4, 10 for sample two, hypothesized difference of zero, alpha of 0.01. So those are all my inputs, then everything else is going to be calculated for me. The first thing to calculate is degrees of freedom. And of course, that's just N1 plus N2 minus two. So in this case, L4 plus L7 minus two. And then my T-score formula is the first place where it's really easy to make a mistake. So the numerator is fairly straightforward. I'm just taking the first mean minus the second mean minus the hypothesized difference. So notice L2 minus L5 minus L8, close the parenthesis. That's the entire numerator. The denominator is all of this thing. And this is where it's really easy to mess up just one parenthesis or just one square root function and end up with a completely different solution altogether. So let's talk about it. First of all, and it's very difficult to tell, but I've got a black um, parenthesis and the other black parenthesis is not until I get to the very, very end. And that is key because I want all of this to be my denominator. So whatever color you have first should be the very, very, very last color as well. And it shouldn't occur anywhere in the middle. So now let's take a look. The first square root function is going to be n1 minus one 
times the standard deviation squared plus n2 minus 1 times that standard deviation squared and then close that parenthesis. So notice here I've opened a green parenthesis but I closed it right away and I opened a green parenthesis and I closed it right away but my numerator is a purple, it kind of looks black, but that's purple here and here. So I'm taking all of that as the numerator of my first fraction, dividing it by L11, which is the degrees of freedom, then closing that parenthesis, and that's the parenthesis for the first square root. So that is the first um, expression in my denominator. The other expression in my denominator is the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And again, notice square root, open parenthesis that's red, close parenthesis that's red. Now that I've completed that one, I'm closing the black parenthesis, which closes the entire uh, denominator. So that is my t-score. The rest of it is going to look fairly similar. Again, we're dealing with the t-distribution, so left-tailed is t-dist. Um, make sure that you're pointing to the t-score, the degrees of freedom. Right-tailed is t-dist right tail, and two-tailed is t-dist two-tail. And we can get around that whole issue with the negative and not being able to use a negative um, t-score by just taking the absolute value, which is what I've done here. I'm still using that same if-then to reject or fail to reject. My point estimate for my um, in interval is just L2 minus L7, I'm sorry, L5, which is the two means. And then, of course, the critical value. This first one, and I should have said that, this is one-tailed, and this is two-tailed. So you can see up here, this is left-tailed, right-tailed. So this is one-tailed critical value margin of error. One-tailed. And this is two-tailed. Two-tailed. And so again, because our question that we were looking at um, was a one-tailed, a left-tailed test, this is the p-value that I'm using, which failed to reject, which is the conclusion that we came to. And then the critical value, again, I'm just use, going to use that absolute value um, to make sure that it ends up as a positive critical value. So I'm doing t inverse of L9 comma L11. L9, of course, is alpha. And then L11 is degrees of freedom. The margin of error, again, that's that crazy formula. So if you got it right here, just come up to the formula box and copy and paste it. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. And then the lower bound, again, the center of our interval is always the point estimate. So that would be here at P5. And then we're subtracting and adding the margin of error, which is L, I'm sorry, P8. So those two match the values that we found by hand, negative 3.6, positive 1.8. Um, just for fun, I'll go ahead and show you the two-tailed. So again, the p-value we already talked about was the two-dist. The critical value, t inverse two-tail. And then margin of error, again, same formula here, just multiplied by the um, critical value that's a little bit different. And then still point estimate minus point estimate plus. Coming up next, we'll take a look at hypothesis testing for two sample means, and in this case, we will look at two dependent samples or paired samples.